Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the fellowship we have together. Thank you for the teaching of your word. Thank you because of the way you are using every minister here to reveal the mind of God, the revelation of the truth to everyone at this time. We pray that as we learn and see these things from your word, there will be grace available for every one of us to keep faithful to your word in Jesus' name. We come to this session, Lord, to learn from you on how to pray and what to pray for. Therefore, Lord, we pray that your spirit will guide us and will apply all these things in our hearts so that we will know how to pray, we will know what to pray for. And grant us the faith that when we pray, the answer will always come. In Jesus' name, we pray. Yesterday, we examined the model of prayer that Jesus Christ taught his disciples. And because it has pleased the Lord to call us by the preaching of the gospel to become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we also have the desire in our hearts that the Lord himself will teach us as he taught those early disciples how to pray. And so we have examined one part of the Lord's Prayer written in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 through to verse 13. Remember yesterday, I looked at general observations on the prayer. I looked at the attitude we ought to have as we look at this prayer. I also looked at the relationship we ought to maintain with the Lord as shown or revealed in this prayer. We also saw the focus of the prayer itself and then we dealt with the fatherhood of god as well as reverence and honor for the name of the lord that part of the message yesterday i titled the pattern of prayer as we come to the prayer once again today we want to look at the priority of prayer let's look at it once again after this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we look at this prayer, we know that the Lord is not just wanting words coming out of our mouth. If we say the right thing, but we have the wrong attitude or the wrong disposition, then the Lord will look beyond the words we utter and there will be no answer to such a prayer. As we look at this prayer, let's look at some general things once again. I cannot say our. That is, you cannot even begin the prayer saying our Father. I cannot say our if I live only for myself in a spiritually watertight compartment before i can even say the prayer at all even say the first word of the prayer i must make sure that i break down all the walls i surround myself with i must make sure that i break down 
all the defenses I surround myself with so that I can confidently say our with an unselfish spirit. I cannot say father if I do not endeavor each day to act like his child. How do I say our father? If heaven does not see in my conduct, in my behavior, in everything that I do that I'm acting like a child of God, I cannot say who art in heaven. If I am laying up no treasure there, because to say that our Father we chat in heaven will mean that my heart is there, my mind is there, my desires are there. And where you put your treasure, that is where your heart will be. How then can you say our Father we chat in heaven if you are not laying any treasure there, your heart, your mind will not be there. I cannot say, hallowed be thy name, if I am not daily striving, endeavoring to honor him alone. In all I say, in all I do, daily striving to live in holiness. I cannot say thy kingdom come. If I am not doing all in my power to hasten the coming of the kingdom. What am I doing every day of my life to hasten that wonderful event? If I am saying with my mouth, thy kingdom come, it must be that with my hands, with my actions and activity, I am doing things to hasten the coming of the kingdom. I cannot say thy will be done if I am disobedient to the word of God. How can I, on one hand, be rebellious, be disobedient, trample the word of God on the feet, and then on the other hand say, thy will be done. Before I can say thy will be done, I must be endeavoring to be obedient to the word. I cannot say in earth as it is in heaven. If I am not serving him here and now. I cannot say give us this day our daily bread. If I am seeking to meet my needs dishonestly. How can I go in the way of dishonesty? In the way of fraud? And in the way that is contrary to the will of the Father? And at the same time I'm saying, well, although I'm stealing, Although I'm fraudulent, although I'm going the wrong way, all the same God, give me this day or give us this day our uh, deliberate. There'll be a contradiction in words with attitude and your action will speak contrary to what you are praying. I cannot say, forgive us our debts if I harbor a grudge against anyone. I cannot say, as we forgive our debtors, if I, forg if I do not forget injuries caused by offenders. I cannot say, lead us not into temptation, if I deliberately place myself in the path of temptation. How could you place yourself right in the midst of the temptation and at the same time say, O oh Lord, lead us not into temptation? I cannot say, deliver us from evil if I do not put on the whole armor of God. That's the armor to put on so that you can stand and withstand in the evil day. And if you are not putting on that armor, how can you at the same time say, deliver us from evil? I cannot say, thine is the kingdom. If I do not give the king the loyalty deal him as a faithful subject. I cannot say and the power. If I constantly fear what men may do to me, I cannot say and the glory. If I am seeking honor for myself, if I'm seeking honor for my loved ones, I cannot say forever. If the horizon of my life is bounded completely by time, if in my thought in my desires there is no thought of an everlasting relationship with god there is no thought of eternity how can i then say forever when all my life all my desires are bounded completely by time you see this prayer 
It's not a prayer you can just say the words out without it having a deep root in your spirit, in your heart, and in your attitude. This prayer and all prayers demand the right spirit and the right attitude. The section we're looking at in the prayer today will lead us to three points. Number one, desire and concern for God's kingdom. Desire and concern for God's kingdom. Number two, knowledge of God's will in prayer. The knowledge of God's will in prayer. Number three, submission to God's will on earth. Submission to God's will on earth. Number one, desire and concern for God's kingdom. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. For a person to pray like this, thy kingdom come, means he is desirous of the arrival of the king to set up his kingdom. For a person to pray like this means he is fed up of all the kingdoms of the world and he wants the kingdom of God to come to replace all the kingdoms of the world. For a person to pray like this, it means that he has come to the realization that all the kingdoms of the world from the time of Egypt to the time of Assyria, to the time of Syria, to the time of Babylon, to the time of the Medo Persians, and to the time of the Romans, and to the time of the Greeks, and to the contemporary kingdoms of today, he is conscious of the fact that they have failed. And therefore, he wants a kind of kingdom established by the Lord, a kind of kingdom operated by the Lord, a kind of kingdom that is spiritual, a kind of kingdom that Satan will have no part in, he is fed up with all the kingdoms around him, the kingdoms of history and the, and the kingdoms of the present time, and he now wants the future promised kingdom of God to arrive and to come. There is a desire within him that because all these other kingdoms have failed and it will continue to fail and right now they have had about 6,000 years to try and they have not succeeded. One replaces the other and since all these thousands of years they are collapsing and they are failing. It is not the desire of these believers saying, Oh God, you have granted enough chance, enough, enough opportunity to the kings and the princes of the world to be able to make a kingdom that will be of spiritual benefit unto the sons of men. Thousands of years they have had the chance to do that. They have not done it. They cannot do it. They will not do it. Therefore, Lord, bring your kingdom. There is a desire for the kingdom of God to come. Not only that, there is a concern for that kingdom. That, O oh Lord, there is a deep concern that we know you will do what you will do. But is there anything, O oh Lord, in our hands which we can do to speed the coming of the kingdom? There is a concern that, O oh Lord, is there anything I can do personally? Is there anything I can encourage my fellow brother, my fellow sister to do? So that the combined activity of the people of God will then fulfill some prerequisites of God to make the people to come. That's a concern in the heart of the person praying like this. Thy kingdom come. This prayer, thy kingdom come, is expressed to the one who has the right to rule and to reign on the earth. A true child of God concerns himself not so much with his own plans, his own desires, as he does with God's revealed plan of his divine program. 
it takes quite a transformation of life for a believer to come to the place where instead of saying my kingdom come instead of saying my rule of authority let it arrive instead of saying let my dominion come it takes quite a transformation it takes the death of the self-life for him to forget all about himself and to say oh lord not my kingdom not his kingdom not my fellow brother's kingdom not my sister's kingdom now the only thing i'm concerned about thy kingdom come because you know too often our prayers are filled with our own kingdom our own reign our own rule our own desires our own ambition our own ambition aspiration for a particular thing we want to grab and it is like we're saying i want a kingdom pharaoh had one i want one nebuchadnezzar had one i want one and so and so had a kingdom i want one by all means even if i will rule and reign for only three months i need i want a kingdom but it will take a transformation a change of life a change of desires a right about on a complete abandonment of your own self that your very self and you say lord i don't want any kingdom anymore all the others even the people that are better than me they had kingdoms they have all failed now my prayer is thy kingdom come how i pray that that will be our prayer that every one of us will forget our personal agenda a personal opinion a personal ambition a personal aspiration a personal private kingdom and now we'll be praying to the lord thy kingdom come we need to relinquish the rule of our own lives and sincerely ask the holy spirit to take control while we pray thy kingdom come and actually when you come to that situation the only issues that will be very much upon your heart that you'll be concerned with will be the issues of the kingdom of God alone. And if that is what it is, what then will characterize your life? In Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now, the Lord Jesus had been talking about food, about shelter, and about our lives. And he had said over in those verses, Do not worry, do not be anxious for what you will eat, for what you will put on, for where you will live, and for the material things of the world. He says, Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now in verse 33 it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we're going to pray this prayer aright, thy kingdom come. It must mean that with all that is within us, with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our lives, everything within us will be telling the Lord, Oh Lord, I don't want any kingdom anywhere. Thy kingdom come and it's thy kingdom alone you'll be seeking it you'll be praying for it you'll be preaching for it you'll be seeing how you will expand the kingdom of god and that will be the very first thing in your life and then other things shall be added unto you now to put that kingdom first and to make sure that by all means the coming of that kingdom is fulfilled look at your attitude or what your attitude should be in matthew chapter 13 Matthew chapter 13 from verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, the, unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man has found, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he has and buyeth the field. If we're going to truly and really pray, thy kingdom come, this attitude of selling everything off 
giving up every other thing even the things that are right that are legitimate that are profitable that are useful to us abandoning everything in search of the kingdom of god the kingdom of heaven the lord jesus christ himself said this is what you can liken the kingdom of god to or the kingdom of heaven to so important so essential so indispensable that when you discover that kingdom for the joy that you cannot be part in the kingdom you sell off everything you give up everything number one if there is any sin in your life you give up the sin if you appreciate the kingdom of god if you know the value of the kingdom of god we will not have to be pleading with you to give up sin that will come automatically because you appreciate the kingdom so much anything that is sinful in your life you give it up so you'll be in the kingdom not only that number two the things that were gained to you the things that were profitable to you paul the apostle said i profited in the jewish religion more than many of my equals and yet when he discovered christ the pearl of great price when he discovered the kingdom when he discovered this kingdom we're talking about he said the things that were gained to me all those things i counted lost and done for the excellency of christ and before you can pray with the right attitude before you can pray with any truth in your heart you have to give up even the things that were legitimately yours rightly yours so that you'll possess the kingdom in verse 45 again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pill who when he had found one one pill of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it you've been looking for joy for happiness in your life and eventually you discover the only place you can have that joy and happiness is in christ in the kingdom of god and therefore you went and you sold everything that will con that will be contrary to that kingdom and you say oh lord here i come empty-handed all the things that tied me down that would have pulled me back i've rejected everything i've forsaken everything now i want the kingdom in matthew chapter 11 from verse 12 and from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force we should understand as preachers that the kingdom of god is so great that before anyone can enter in he will have to be violent to himself violent to his own sin violent to the things he loved before and in our preaching we should make the people understand that sometimes we make it too easy you make the message so simple so easy that you feel that well everybody should come into the kingdom are they not going to leave their girlfriends that's going to take some violence are they not going to give up their bottles of beer that's going to take some violence are they not going to give up all their packets of cigarettes it's going to take some violence are they not going to give up all their dubious ways of doing business that is going to take some violence are they not going to give up all the things that minister to the pleasures simple pleasures of the flesh it's going to take some violence are they not going to even give up some position in the country to which they belong if that position is threatening righteousness in their lives it's going to take some violence are they not going to give up the denomination they have been attacked to all their lives and they had felt that that denomination not christ but denomination will take them to heaven and already they have become maybe a knight there that's knight starting with k 
they have become a big officer in that particular denomination and everybody is telling them if you are not here we don't know how their denomination can continue and now he hears the word of the kingdom and he wants to enter into the kingdom if you preachers are going to help such an individual tell him without violence he cannot get saved without being violent to all the things that mattered to him in the past he will not be able to get saved from the time of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force look at a parallel passage in luke chapter 16 verse 16 The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. That means it's going to take some effort to get into that kingdom. You should have done that yourself, pressed into the kingdom. And also you will see, as you are being called to become a pastor and a leader, if you are going to be useful in the kingdom of God, there are some things that you even have to be violent with. You have been saved. You have been sanctified. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. You have known the scriptures. You have got a call of God upon your life. And now you want to meet that call. So that you will be able to uh, be an instrument that will expand the kingdom of God. There is a kind of violence that is required in your life. In Luke chapter 9 from verse 59 and he said unto another follow me and he said lord suffer me first to go and bury my father jesus said unto him let the dead bury their dead but go thou and preach the kingdom of god you cannot even begin to pray the kingdom of god without severing some ties and relationships. You see, there are some people that are still mommy's son, mommy's daughter, at the age of 45, at the age of 55. And whatever decision they want to take, mother must know about it. If they're going to give up whole company, whole business, if they're going to give up whole profession, if they're going to give up what has been bringing thousands of the national currency into the family pulse, they have to tell their mother about it. And mother didn't hear the call. Mother didn't see the vision. Mother didn't know anything that the Lord is talking to you about abandoning everything to come and preach the gospel. And if you are not going to sever that relationship and close your mind and close your heart and just be brutal and sever that cord and say i am going to preach the gospel you'll never preach the gospel if you are saying well daddy is sick and daddy may die anytime and i'm the firstborn of daddy and if i go now on missionary field and i continue to preach the gospel if i hear that daddy dies what am i going to do being the firstborn i will wait and allow daddy to die and because you love daddy so much, you don't want him to die in time either. But you are still waiting. And say, Lord, I accept the call. I love you. You know I love you. You know I'm born again. You know I'm sanctified. You know I'm a child of God. I, I know I will end up preaching the gospel. And there is no doubt about that. I know I'm going to do it. It's my life's, it's my life's work. And I'm going to preach the gospel. But Lord, you understand? He's the one that brought me to the world. I owe all my life all my education, all my upbringing, everything I am today, I owe it to daddy. And because of what daddy has done, although I want to serve you, Lord, grant me this indulgence. And let daddy die first, and I do my part, so that our villagers will not be talking against Christianity, and say that Christianity has made him to forget father and mother, and now these people become spiritual and in pretense they say lord i'm seeking for the glory of your name if i just go now 
on missionary field and I leave my aged father there, they are going to be saying that these Christian people, they are not reasonable. They are not remembering their duty to their parents. Therefore, Lord, grant me the indulgence. He will not grant you the indulgence. You might even miss the kingdom of God yourself. Read it again. And he said unto another, follow me. He gave him the call. You see, when some people hear the call, they need one year to think about it. They need three years to pray about it. And he says, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. I'm going to ask you a question, difficult question. What if as we are in this Congress, you looked for somebody that should have been in the Congress and you didn't find him. And then one week after the Congress, you met the brother and you said, brother, I looked for you at the Congress and you were not there. And uh, what happened to you? Well, what happened is that just before the Congress, I heard that my father was sick at home. And I thought that my father might die. And then I told the pastor, I said, Pastor, although I should uh, preach the Monday Bible study in the church this coming Monday, but allow me to run home because of this. Pastor said, no. I said, what? Are you, are you saying the truth? I'm telling you. Pastor said no, but I went because after all, I'm an adult now. So I missed preaching at that Monday Bible study. Then I came back about two days after and I told the pastor, I said, Pastor, not that I disobeyed you because uh, I have the Spirit of God. You, Pastor, too, you have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God allowed me to go. I don't have any condemnation. And then the pastor said, all right, sit at home. You are no more a worker. And you cannot come to the Congress. We have got other people to do the preaching. You, even in this Congress, you are likely to say, uh-uh. <laughs> what kind of leadership is that? That's Jesus' leadership. That's Bible leadership. Many people in this Bible church are forgetting Bible. They're using common sense. Jesus Christ said, go and do that preaching. Let the dead bury the dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Look at verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. Lord, you know me. I will end up being a preacher. Lord, you know me. I will end up being a missionary. Lord, you know me. I will preach the gospel. Lord, you know me. I'll become full time. I will follow you. But there's something. Let me first bid them farewell which are at home at my house oh lord i will follow you but i have a wife at home and um, the concept i understand about husband and wife is that how can i take a decision even following the lord without going back home and telling my wife and see if she will be in agreement with this and then lord i'll bring word to you again and you can be sure if my wife doesn't mind if the people at home if they don't mind that i'm going to follow you and i'm going to preach the gospel then I will come back and I will surrender my life to you and I will preach the gospel. Now listen, we don't allow that for people who are getting saved. If you preach the gospel and a person has been a sinner and you tell him, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then you say, if you are going to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ now, abandon the idol and abandon all those sinful things you want to do that now raise up your hand we're going to pray and you're going to repent and turn away from sin then you see a man there that is a sinner he didn't raise up his hand but you saw he was crying tears were coming out and you saw that he was bothered he was convicted because of his sin and but he refused to come forward he refused to come and pray and then at the end you saw him and the spirit of god was telling you that that man is under conviction you're calling yourself friend i saw you were crying 
when I was making the altar call. But all the same, you didn't raise up your hand. And you didn't respond. What's the matter? And the fellow said, oh, I was convicted. And I know except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But I didn't come out because I have a wife at home. And you know, me and my wife, we normally take decisions together. And we normally decide what we're going to do. And although I see that this is the right thing, but I don't like to hurt my wife. I don't like to injure her. I don't like to do anything that will inconvenience her at all. Although I really want to get saved, I'll go home and discuss it. You preachers, what do you tell him? You say, no, this is a personal matter. The Lord is calling you into the kingdom of God. You say, you must repent now or tomorrow may be too late for you. The conviction you have now may fade off and you will never have the opportunity again. You say, right now, get on your knees, repent, and give your life to the Lord. That's what you say. Are you not a hypocrite then? When the Lord calls you, and you have a great conviction upon your life, and you're almost trembling with conviction, because you know those people are perishing, and the Lord is saying, go and preach the gospel. And then you say, Lord, I'll preach the gospel. No doubt about it, but I have a wife at home. And what they have taught us in this deeper life pulpit is that husband and wife are one. Oh yes, we taught that. But we didn't mean that if, if your wife backslides, run after her and backslide because you are one. We didn't say if your wife does not want you to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. We didn't say that unity in the family means that you rather dishonor the Lord, disobey the Lord, disregard the Lord, and then follow your wife. We didn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible is teaching you that except a man hate father, hate mother, hate wife, that's the Bible, hate children, and hate his very life also. He cannot be my disciple. And as we are here, you cannot really pray, intelligently pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, if you are not submitting yourself completely to the kingdom. And if uh, your wife has to edit your message, if your wife has to say that illustration you gave when you were preaching people will think i am a bad woman people will think that i'm a bad slider you preach like that these people are not going to respect me if your wife is the one editing your message moderating your message and the one that will not allow you to say the cogent pungent convicting word in the bible you are no more a preacher you are already disqualified from the kingdom of god and you cannot pray thy kingdom come because you are not a servant to the king of the kingdom you are a servant and a boy uh, to your wife it takes violence to be able to come out straight and to bring the word of God and to say, I will not go and seek permission from the people at home. The Lord is calling me and I'm obeying the call of God. Look at it in verse 61. And another search also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand on the plow, and looking back taking permission from your wife that's looking back going back to say farewell to the people at home that's looking back going to daddy and mommy to say shall i honor the lord shall i obey the lord shall i shall i do what the lord wants me to do that is looking back no man having put his son to the plow and looking back his feet for the kingdom of god well then if we're going to pre preach the kingdom the kingdom has to be a priority in our lives. And when we think about the kingdom, can I point to you five faces of the kingdom? You know, many times we just say kingdom, kingdom. And we do not understand and we do not know what are the various aspects and the various faces of the kingdom of God. There are five of them. Number one, there is the universal kingdom. Number two, there is the past aspect of the kingdom over Israel. 
Number three, there is a present spiritual kingdom. Number four, there is the earthly millennial kingdom. Number five, there is a future eternal kingdom. Number one, universal kingdom. That is God being king over the whole universe. God is king over the whole universe. In Psalm 22 and verse 28. Psalm 22, verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and is the governor among the nations. That's talking about the overruling power and authority and rule and reign of the Almighty God, that He is supreme above all. And He still does everything, plans everything, coordinates everything according to His mighty majestic plan in psalm 103 psalm 103 verse 19 103 verse 19 the lord has prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all that is the universal kingdom of god then i told you number two past aspect of the kingdom over Israel past aspect of the kingdom over Israel do you remember when the disciples of Jesus Christ asked him and said would you at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel look at Acts chapter 1 verse 6 when they therefore were come together they asked of him saying Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In that language, restore again. It means there was a kingdom before. They lost it. They wanted a restoration of that kingdom. And it said, will you again restore the kingdom unto Israel? There was a past aspect of the kingdom did israel know that oh yes israel knew in first chronicles chapter 29 first chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 thine O lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and earth is nine thine is the kingdom o lord and thou art exalted as head above all both riches and honor come of thee and thou reignest over all and in thine hand is power and might and in thy hand is to make great and to give strength unto all Although that also talks about the aspect that is universal, the universal kingdom of God. But the king of Israel recognized that in particular. Number one, universal kingdom. Number two, past aspect of the kingdom. Number three, present spiritual kingdom. In the present time, the present era or age, there is the kingdom in Luke chapter 17 verses 20 and 21 and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come he answered them and said the kingdom of God cometh not with observation neither shall they say lo here or lo there for behold the kingdom of God is within you that's the present aspect of the kingdom and the moment you are born again you enter into that spiritual kingdom that present kingdom Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his son it means if we are born again if we're redeemed we are already in that spiritual part of the kingdom now he has delivered us 
and he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Number four, there is the earthly millennial kingdom. Earthly millennial kingdom. In Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign, there's a kingdom there, and shall reign with him a thousand years. A thousand years, that is a millennium. And there is the earthly millennial kingdom zechariah chapter 14 still talking about the millennial kingdom zechariah chapter 14 verse 9 the lord shall be king over all the earth now we have talked about the universal kingdom of god that he rules over all that's not in the future. That universal kingdom of God is for the past and the now. But this is talking about a future kingdom. And it is the millennial reign that is in view here. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And all the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be, it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Amaniel unto the king's wine presses. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. That's earthly, that's millennial. Number five, the future eternal kingdom. There is also a future as aspect of the kingdom beyond the millennium that is eternal, everlasting. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and a kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdom and it shall stand forever that is the future eternal kingdom let me review what you once again. Number one, universal kingdom. Because God is king over the whole universe. Number two, the past aspect of the kingdom over Israel. Number three, the present spiritual kingdom. Number four, the earthly millennial kingdom. Number five, the future eternal kingdom. Come back to Matthew chapter 6. Verse 10. Thy kingdom come. This prayer is both evangelistic and eschatological. What does that mean? When you pray, thy kingdom come. You are asking God to lead people to repentance. The kingdom is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. From the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God saw violence and the violent take it by force. Or you say in Luke, from the kingdom of, uh, from the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God saw violence and men press into the kingdom. They enter into the kingdom. When you pray that kingdom come, the rule of Christ come in the heart of that man, in the heart of that woman, in the heart of that neighbor it's an evangelistic praying you are saying oh lord lead them to repentance convict them stir them up to press into the kingdom establish christ's reign and christ's rule in the hearts of men you see when you preach and people know the truth 
The kingdom is very near. They are very near to the kingdom. They are not there yet, but they are very near. In Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Does that mean you are not far from God's universal kingdom? No. Because whether that man repents or not, God is king over all. Does that mean that you are not far from the kingdom to be restored unto Israel? No. That single man cannot decide the coming of the kingdom for the whole of Israel. Does that mean you are not far from the millennial kingdom? No. That one will come at a time appointed by the Father. Does that mean you are not far from the future eternal kingdom? No, not at all. That is still far away in the future, in the eternal, even beyond the millennial kingdom. It's saying you are not far from the spiritual kingdom. The kingdom whereby your life will be transformed, your life will be changed, is very, very near now if you can repent and offer yourself unto the Lord. Thou art not far from the kingdom. Number two, when you are praying thy kingdom come, you are asking the Lord to redeem Israel and to break the rule of other kingdoms over Israel and to come to the time that the Bible has said a remnant in Israel shall be saved. To come to the time where the word of God has definitely declared that the Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the nations until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You are saying, O oh Lord, when will it be? When you are saying, Thy kingdom come. First of all, spiritual kingdom, let people repent, let people be convicted, let people be converted, let people be born again, let them get into the kingdom. But number two, you are praying for the restoration of the kingdom unto Israel. You are saying, O oh Lord, Jerusalem had been trodden down under the feet of the Gentiles. And when will the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled? When you will restore the kingdom once again unto Israel. But not only that, when you pray, thy kingdom come. You're asking God to put an end to rebellion all over the world and establish a pure government, a pure kingdom where righteousness and holiness will reign. Second Peter chapter 3 from verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and also the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these sins shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You see, when you pray thy kingdom come, you are saying, oh Lord, there's so much conflict in this world, so much sin in this world, so much suffering in this world. Oh Lord, you have a kingdom better than all the kingdoms of this world. Oh Lord, look at the unrest, look at the suffering from nation to nation all over the world. Look at the confusion. When are you going to bring the kingdom? And you go on your knees and with real devotion in your heart, you say, Lord, thy kingdom come. Let's now go to Matthew chapter 6. Reading from verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That leads us to point number two, the knowledge of God's will in prayer. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
If we're going to pray aright, we must pray according to the will of God. Thy will be done. Understand, that is the very priority of God. He wants his will, not your will, not my will. He wants his will to be done. You better find out what is the will of God. You better find out whether that item, that request you are offering to God in prayer, whether it is part of the will of God. If it is part of the will of God, prayer will not take a long time. The prayer will be answered. In 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Why doesn't he hear sometimes? Because what we're asking, unfortunately, is not according to his will. It contradicts the prayer that Jesus taught us that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God wants his will to be done in the village where you are, in the town, in the city where you are. In a church where you are. God wants his will to be done in the life of that person you are counseling. And therefore your prayer for that individual must be according to the revealed will of God. Can you pray for a second woman in a house to have children? Will that be the will of God? No. Because if the woman is the second wife, that's not the right place. And if you pray, he'll have, she'll have happiness there joy there no problem there children there prosperity there and just have a happy marital life as a second wife in that place that's not the will of god god is not involved in that god is not going to answer that kind of prayer can you pray for a thief and say well this thief comes and he says pastor you know i've stolen a lot i defrauded the government i did this i did that but I hear that you people here, you can pray. And he told me that if I come to this church, that you will, they will pray for me. And the government is trying to investigate the case right now, uh, that I stole a lot of it. And truly, I will tell you, you are a pastor, you are not a policeman. I wouldn't tell policeman this, but because you are a pastor, I will tell you, I really stole. And, and I drained the purse of that company. I really did it. But I want you, pastor, to pray for me, because you see, I want to serve God. Just pray for me. They will not imprison me. They will not catch me. Pray for my lawyer that my lawyer will say everything that he ought to say and I will just be discharged. I will come back and uh, I will donate my tithe to the church. Can you pray that prayer? The will of God is restitution. The will of God is not covering up. The will of God is not that a man will escape punishment. Punishment is necessary. Punishment is good. As the punishment will tell the man that this is wrong. That will make him to fight to escape the punishment that is yet to come. Don't you see in the church, in the Corinthian church, when somebody committed adultery or committed immorality or whatever you want to call it with uh, the father's wife. And then when Paul the apostle heard about it, what's the will of God? Deliver the man unto Satan, that his body may be tortured and tormented. And when he feels the pain in his body, he will run to God and say, God, I may lost sinner, have mercy upon me. It's not the will of God. We pray for prostitutes not to be sick. We pray for the people that are living in sin and they are still chewing their tobacco. And we say, oh God, although they are chewing their tobacco, let our faith work in a dynamic way. Don't allow them to have sickness or cancer. They will have sickness and cancer. What they sow, they will reap. You can fast for 40 days and 80 days. God will not answer that prayer because it is against the will of God. Now we pray, uh, you know, somebody has committed sin. And, uh, you know, he's a pastor in the church. And he says, well, if they know this, they're going to fire me. They're going to discipline me because this is very bad. Uh, that girl of 14 years of age, I don't know what came upon me, that I went into immorality with her and she was bleeding all over. And I just lost my senses. And I'm a pastor. And, uh, and then you speak to the girl, you say, uh, girl, you know, you don't know Bible, but I'm a pastor. God will forgive. God will forgive. <laughs> That's how God forgives. You won't suffer. You won't bear the, the real uh, cordial and the real scourge of your sin. 
Ah, it's not like that. And then you go to pray your fast three days and three nights. Oh God, let not the church know this. God will not connive with evil. God is not going to cover up. We will know one way or the other. Oh God, don't let them discipline me. That prayer will not be answered. Oh God, you see how serious I am? Are you serious? A fornicator is serious? An immoral fellow is serious? A person that can go and take a 14-year-old girl and ruin the life of that girl is a serious member of the church? And then you pray and you say, God, you said, if I ask anything, anything according to his will. Not just anything. We just don't pray foolish prayers. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It is when we pray according to his will. That's the confidence that we have. That we ask anything according to his will. He heareth us. Oh Lord, I know that I am not paying my tithe. But I want you to bless me anyhow. I want you to build a house for me there and buy this for me there and provide this for me and provide that for me and help me, Lord, uh, still to be able to get prosperity although I don't pay my tithe. Is that the will of God? When he has commanded, bring all ye the tithe into the storehouse of the Lord and then prove me now herewith if I will not open the windows of heaven. How will you open the windows of heaven when you are rebellious and disobedient and selfish and stingy? You have to fulfill the condition and do the will of God. It is when we do the will of God that God will answer our prayer. Look at John. John chapter 9. Gospel according to St. John. And in verse 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Which means then, when you pray, thy will be done. That prayer can only be effective when you are actually praying according to the will of God. Knowledge of God's will helps and increases faith for a speedy answer. Ignorance of God's will will hinder faith and will delay the answer. Now, this prayer, I want you to look at it. Thy will be done. Some people offer that prayer in an attitude of bitter resentment, feeling that they cannot fight against the inevitable. Oh, they say, I would have liked this situation to change, but look at what God has done. It appears that God has made up his mind that this is what will be done. I don't want it. I don't enjoy it. I'm not even quietly submissing to, submitting to it. But what can I do? How can I fight against the inevitable? Well, O oh Lord, thy will be done. That's not the right attitude. Others pray thy will be done in an attitude of passive resignation. They are too lazy to search the scriptures. They are too lazy to find out what is the promise of God. They are too lazy to know what does God want accomplished in this situation. Therefore, in their ignorance, although the devil is oppressing them and tormenting them and tearing them apart, and because of their ignorance, they have this kind of passive resignation. They say, well, the will of the Lord be done. Other people pray this prayer because of theological confusion. You see, there are some people that are confused with theology. They have studied their theology, not Bible. They have studied their Greek, not Bible. They have studied their Hebrew, not Bible. They have studied the philosophies of men, not Bible. They have studied the history, so-called history, of the kind of church they are studying so much that they feel that prayer cannot change anything. They say, whatever will be, will be. Therefore, there is no use. They are confused by theology. Therefore, they say, if that child is dying, if that woman is not getting saved, if that husband is getting far, farther and farther away from the kingdom, oh, they say, well, I don't know whether he is one of the elect or not. I don't know whether I will ever get anything or not. Therefore, because of that theological confusion, they say, oh, Lord, thy will be done. If wife is going to go to hell, thy will be done. 
If husband will never repent and go to hell, there will be no theological confusion. Why don't you find out the will of God? How do you know the will of God? You know the will of God from the word of God. Now, if we know the will of God, will that will of God automatically be done? Whether we pray or not, do you know there are some people who have that idea? Oh, they say, I don't pray much. Why do I need to pray much? Look at this. It is simple logic. If this thing is the will of God, he will do it. Whether I pray or I don't pray. If this thing is not the will of God, he will not do it. Whether I pray or I don't pray. So why, have to, why do I have to spend time and pray and pray and pray? before it's done. If God wants me to be saved, he will save me. I, nobody can resist his will. He has known from all eternity those who will be saved and if I am among the number, he will save me. And if God doesn't want me to be saved, I don't know. If he doesn't want me to be saved, if I cry and weep and pray 40 years and I pray every day, I will not be saved. Therefore, if it is his will, I won't worry myself. If God wants me to be a pastor, he will do it at his own time. Why should I pray about it? Why should I study the Bible? Why should I prepare myself? Why should I agonize and say, Lord, come and do this? If it is his will, no problem. There is problem. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. And I want you to see in this passage how the Lord said many things that he will do. If you look at verse 11, it says, I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estate, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Look at verse 12. Yea, I will. That's just the first part of it. And as you go on, you will see that God over and over repeatedly said, I will, I will, I will. And if you come on to verse 23, it says, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. If you go to verse 24, for I will take you from among the heathen. And gather you out of all the countries. I will bring you. That's the word I will again. I will bring you into your own land. Verse 25. I will sprinkle clean waters upon you. And ye shall be clean. In verse 26. The new heart also will I give you. And in verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. And on and on it goes talking about what God will do. Look at verse 36. Then the hidden that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Look at the confirmation and I will do it. That's where some people stop. And they say, God has his will. God will do it. Whether we pray or we don't pray, but now go to verse 37. Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. Although he had repeatedly said, I will, I will, I will, so many times. And yet he tells us at the end of the whole thing, he says, yet before I do all this, I will be inquired of by the house of Israel. Well, if you study your Bible, you will know that God's promises express God's will. It is God's will that we be saved. It is God's will that we be healed and delivered, sanctified, filled with the Spirit, blessed by the Lord. It is His will that will become useful instruments in His hand that we are fruitful in the work of the ministry. It is his will because of his promise that we be steadfast to the very end. It is his will that we endure unto the end and eventually we are received into the everlasting kingdom. Yet understand, all those things that are the will of God, we have to pray for. Now, submission to the will of God on earth. Submission to God's will on earth. 
in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is what tells us that God wants a holy Christian doing the will of God every day without interruption as angels do the will of God in heaven. We don't need any other proof that holiness is the will of God. Righteousness is the will of God. It's not the will of God to backslide. It's not the will of God to be only partially holy. It is not the will of God that we're not living upright life, pure life, righteous life. It is not the will of God that we live a substandard, a subscriptural life. He wants us to do his will and obey his word and to live in righteousness and holiness here on earth as the angels do in heaven. You know, some people, whenever we preach and we say there is gossip, there shouldn't be gossip, there shouldn't be backbiting, there shouldn't be bitterness. Oh, they say, why is pastor wasting his time? It will always be. There is no church that will ever be free from all these things. They will always be there. Why doesn't pastor leave all these areas of holiness and righteousness? Because no matter how we cry, no matter how we preach, no matter how we make noise, the people cannot be totally holy. The church is still in the world. That's not God. That's Satan talking. The will of God is that all the people associated with the Lord, reconciled unto the Lord, all the people that are in the kingdom of God, they will do the will of God here on earth as it is known in heaven. Holiness is the will of God. Holiness in the individual, Holiness in the whole church, and not only in the local church, holiness in all the churches. Can we say this morning that the kingdom of God is well established in the heart of every member of people that say they are deep alive? Are we convinced that in every local church associated with deep alive, all the people there, all the people there that say they belong to this church, are we sure that they have entered into the kingdom? Are they caught in of everything that will hinder them to get into the kingdom? Are they desirous of the kingdom? Have they abandoned their own kingdom? Are they exalting, elevating, desiring, esteeming only the kingdom of God? Can we say with any iota of truth, that all the members of our churches, that the will of God alone is their consuming desire, that what they are praying for every time is, Lord, not my will, not my mother's will, not my daddy's will, not my husband's will, not my wife's will. I know people here that can leave the church if that's the will of their wives. If their wives will keep on complaining, about the preacher and say they don't love us in this church they don't want us in this church look at it whenever he preaches he must say something against me my husband is this where we are going to be for the rest of our lives i know husbands that will say well since my wife doesn't enjoy the church anymore i better pack my load and leave the church you are under the wheel of your wife but the Lord wants you to come to the situation where you say, not my wife's will. My wife doesn't dictate the messages I preach. There are people here, if their wives are against a particular thing, they cannot preach that thing. If their wives are using jewelry privately, if their wives are using some cosmetics and some things, uh, some additions to their hair, or their wives are using some things, they dare not touch that area of message. Which will are we here for? And here we are at the Congress. This church, except every one of you that I see now, sitting down or standing up, a man, a woman, except you'll come to the situation where you say, Oh Lord, not my will, not my wife's will, not my husband's will, not anybody's will. I want to do the will of God in heaven as angels do the will of God. You know, we don't have time. We don't have time. Time is going. And the Lord will soon come. And except we come to this realization, except you are praying with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and you are saying, thy kingdom come, 
how can you make the rapture if you're all for your kingdom all for your pursuit all for your desires all for your aspiration all for your own ambition all for what will be convenient for your flesh how will you ever make heaven you know sometimes i think about it and i say a church as large as this how many of them will make heaven i think about it every day i see you now here is leaders meeting and uh, last night when the preacher finished his preaching he said if there are people here that are living in besetting sin raise up your hand and you must know that as the pastor i have to open my eyes and watch i wanted to see how many of the people we gather together here who are supposed to be preaching against sin preaching against satan preaching for the kingdom of god to come i want to see how many of them are still under the feet of the devil and i saw hand in every hall here and here in front of me and there over there in the french among the french people among the yoruba people in that hall i looked everywhere and i saw people here i, I don't know i think i even saw hands in the choir i saw here i saw every day i said oh my god i'm lost church congress of leaders of the people that are supposed to destroy the works of the devil of the people that should have forgotten sin many years ago of the people that should have been able to say the devil cometh and he findeth nothing in me i saw them raising up their hands they, raised, they were waving it oh yes i want to overcome sin who made you a pastor in deeper life if we are going to do the work of God, let's come to the point where we realize that it will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And if you are going to preach, you must preach according to the will of God. You see how I preach? I'm not looking for friends. I'm not looking for someone to come and shake my hand. That was a good message. If you condemn sin, it's not going to be a good message. Something that cuts you and pierces you and burns you and convicts you ah that's not a good message it's a hard message and here we are at the congress you want to say oh lord the past is past much time has been wasted much ministry has been wasted much of my efforts have been wasted and much of what you have done has been wasted why don't we then start afresh and start anew and say now from now on thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Many years ago, when I knew the Lord, there were many people around me. And those people, church people, they preach salvation, they preach sanctification, they preach Holy Ghost baptism, they preach a lot of things. And I began to obey the word of God. And the pastor of that church, he is dead now, the overseer. He called me and he mentioned my name. He said, you are going too far. You are carrying this thing too far. I said, what have I carried too far? I have not done enough. I want to be spent for the gospel. I want to do the will of God as it is done in heaven. Oh, he said, we must limit the consecration and limit the obedience. I left him. I didn't know I would leave their church, but I left him. I went to pray. I said, God, if there's only one person in the whole world that will do the will of God on this earth as it is done in heaven, if I don't have any encouragement, no other person in the whole world, and I will be the only one to do the will of God, forget family, forget profession, forget education, forget every other thing. And the only assignment I have is to do the will of God on earth as it's done in heaven. I said, Lord, make me that individual. Deeper life had not started that time. It was when they saw that all I wanted was the will of God and the word always reading Bible. I always had my earphone listening to something. I was always reading Pilgrim's Progress, reading Christian Perfection, reading 44 Psalms of John Wesley, reading Charles Finney, reading all those things. And the more I read them, I said, will of God. I was wrong. looking for the will of God. Only the will of God. If they said marriage, I said, I said marriage. I'm looking for the will of God. Where is the will of God? Show it to me. I want to grab it. When they saw that I was too much on will of God, will of God, they kicked me out of their church. But here we are today. This is where that will of God has carried us. But it's now your turn. You are not doing it like I'm doing it. 
You are not standing for it like I'm standing for it. You don't hate yourself, your wife, your husband, your children. I'm telling you, I love this world more than children. And I love this world more than anything and anybody. Are you like that? You are not like that. You are sentimental people. You don't want the will of God. Why don't we at this time come to the Lord and say, Lord, from now on, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Rise up and let us pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in us as it is done in heaven. Are you standing for the truth? Are you standing for the word of God? Are you wanting to do the will of God whatever the cost may be? And you say the cost may be high? Whatever it is, whenever it is, O oh Lord, thy will be done here on earth as it's done in heaven. Are you deviating from the word of God? Rich people in the church will not allow you to do the will of God. Position seeking will not allow you to do the will of God. Looking for ease and pleasure will not allow you to do the will of God. Women will not allow you to do the will of God. Your boss in a place of work will not allow you to do the will of God. A lady in the church, which is like a girlfriend, will not allow you to do the will of God. Marriage will not allow you to do the will of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Can you still preach as we used to preach? Can you still preach as we used to preach? No fear, no favor, no compromise. Are you living above sin? 